Hi, I'm Robin Elander, and I'm here with Kathy Brennan King with the Community Environmental Council. She is the communications and outreach and education coordinator or manager. Did I get that right? What exactly yeah, is that? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Great, and I'm so excited to be here with Kathy. She has a really uh, deep um, passion for our environmental movement here locally, and I'd love for you to tell um, our audience a little bit about your background and um, what your involvement is with Earth Day and the environmental movement locally. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for having me. This course, is really thank fun. You. I'm excited to be here. Um, I was a, we moved to Santa Barbara in 1998 from Los Angeles, and I worked in the television production industry there. So I've kind of always been in sort of a project management role um, in, my, in my professional life. Um, and I stayed home with my kids when they were little, and I got involved at their school um, on PTA. Um, little did I know that was giving me fundraising experience that would later be profitable in the job world. Um, but I started there and I started with school events like carnivals and nighttime fundraisers for parents, um, you know, really digging into event management at that level, um, which sort of prepared me for then when my kids got older and I went back to work and I found the job at the Community Environmental Council and put those same skills to use doing more community facing events that also um, were about sustainability, which is my real true passion. Awesome, awesome. Before we keep going, I think we need to bring your computer down a little bit. I can just see like the top. <laughs> there you go, okay, that's better. Perfect. Maybe I just hold it. It's gonna tip over. Maybe if I could have, put a book or something. <laughs> Prop it up a little bit. There. Is that That's better? perfect. Awesome. All right. So tell us a little bit more about kind of how you got into the environmental um, movement. Of course, you that has a lot to do with CEC. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the mission there and how you bring your passion to your work. Um, well, when my kids got older and I got bored out of volunteering and wanted to go back to work, um, I knew I wasn't going to go back to TV production because there really wasn't a thing in Santa Barbara and it wasn't really my passion. I had always been very interested in the environment and after having children, I really felt responsible to that passion. And so I went to Santa Barbara City College, which is just an incredible resource for our entire community, um, especially for people like me who uh, want to re-enter the workforce and get education for that. So I took all their, um, all the classes that they offered in environmental studies. Wow. And um, that just sort of plugged me into the eco subculture in Santa Barbara. It's a small enough place that you can meet people that way. And I got connected to the CEC through that, through, you know, all the events and learning that I was doing at City College and started working here in 2008. Awesome. Yeah. And Tell me a little bit more about what the CEC does. Um, and you have not just a local real um, effort going on, it's, it's more of a regional effort, right? It is, I mean, we are Santa Barbara focused, but we're kind of tri-county mm -hmm. focused. So we've done work in neighboring counties as well, but mostly Santa Barbara County. Um, the CEC's mission currently is basically climate change solutions um, via our local programs, whether it's getting people, more people into electric cars by putting charging stations as, you know, creating a network of charging stations that make people feel comfortable driving electric cars and having green car shows at our Earth Day Festival and at other um, locations throughout the year. Um, we have a go solar program where we are definitely trying to move the entire community more into solar energy and we've done that in a variety of ways through a program called Solarize where um, individual homeowners can sign up and get a good price through us for adding solar to their house. We've only recently restarted a program called Solarize Nonprofit where we're helping nonprofits put solar on their buildings so that they can stabilize their energy bills and put that money back into their programs. We have four of those so far, and really our, our, our big capstone project for this has been Community Choice Energy, 
where, where energy is decided upon locally. It's not the utility deciding where we're gonna get our energy from. And we've just, just in the past month have passed several of those where our, some of our local jurisdictions have either started their own or they're signing on to others where they are going to spurn local renewable energy development through that. So super exciting. It is super exciting. That's a huge feat. I mean, it I is. just want to pause there and just say, whoa. <laughs> 10 years in the making. Really significant. Talk yeah. about a major community project. Can you talk a little bit about some of the milestones along the way? Because, you know, if someone is interested in taking on a project of that scope and breadth, what are some of the elements that you put together to get to that outcome? Just a, a few touch points. I know that there's years and years of work, but was maybe there was a major community committee, or can you talk a little bit about just a few of the key strategic elements as part of that? It was definitely um, a collaboration among several agencies and other nonprofits. Um, you know, we, we kind of got it going back in 2007 and then the recession hit and people weren't as interested in doing something that might have some startup costs. And through that 10 years, there became a lot of other models. Marin Clean Power, it was the first and was successful. So being able to point to successful models, if, if you're trying to trailblaze, you know, you need optimal, Mm -hmm. conditions, but when there are models that have worked that you can point to, that makes it easier to just sort of slide into that, even though it's still, it still took some time. Um, an easier um, and more relatable um, campaign might be our plastics campaign, um, something else that we've been active on for over 10 years, um, which started with me at City College doing a class project. We had to do a group oh, wow. project. Said, hey, let's get rid of plastic bags in Santa Barbara. <laughs> That's <laughs> how it started. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, and and I took that with me when I came to CEC. And you know, if you especially if you live in a smaller um, city or a town, it's amazing how accessible your um, local elected officials are to you. Um, when I first started on plastic, I emailed the mayor and said, Hey, can I get a meeting with you? I want to talk about how do we get rid of plastic bags. And I had an answer that afternoon, you know, on email. That's so incredible. they they want to hear from their constituents. They want people to get involved. They don't want to just be in the same old echo chamber. So that was a, a, a big eye opener that you can really get to your elected officials and they will listen to you, um, especially if you down again, <laughs> especially <laughs> if, you, if you have a coordinated effort, you know, it's not just one person, but more of a, a coalition, um, you know, that um, shows that you all have a similar goal that you're all working toward, that you're serious about it, that you're willing to put in the work and the time that it's going to take to do that. So really, you know, there has to be an education effort. So the community has to have some education, but you're not going to educate your way out of energy, changing your ener energy, where you're, you know, sourcing your energy from. And you're also not going to educate your way out of millions of plastic bags that are walking out the doors of grocery stores every year, but it is a place to start. You know, and it does then give you something to point to when you go to your elected officials and say, look, we've been standing out in front of this grocery store giving out reusable bags for two weeks and here's the response that we got. Or you do like a little survey with it. So if you, you know, just getting the ball rolling um, in a kind of very grassrootsy sort of way, then I think gives you credibility when you try to make bigger changes in, in policy. Because that was such a huge effort, how, approximately how many people would you say that you had some kind of a touch point with along the way? For plastic bags, hundreds. <laughs> you know, we 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 worked with kids. Um, it's it's been a great way to get involved in the local schools because kids really their hearts go out, especially when you start talking about the marine impacts of single use plastics. And they're just like, you gotta stop killing fish. You gotta stop hurting dolphins. And they, they're willing to just go stand up at city council and, and spill their guts. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does, you know, it, it makes people really want to do something when, when kids are saying, wait, you know, you gotta do this for my future. Um, and so we, had, we worked with a lot of kids and a lot of student groups, um, but also a lot of nonprofits. We've been partnering with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper almost the whole time that we've been doing this. And it's, it's kind of unheard of that two nonprofits with sort of 
parallel missions, but not they don't really cross over that much because they're about clean water and you mm -hmm. know protecting our channel, and we're more land-based stuff that we work on. But we've been collaborating on the plastics work for over a decade. That's huge. It that has morphed. It and could be and themed as like either competition or something like that, but really the, the collaboration made it work. Definitely, definitely. And it helps that our missions don't overlap in a lot of ways. I mean, we're certainly all swimming for, in the same pond for donors, um, but we don't, you know, there wasn't mission drift for either one of us or crossover anything that would feel weird. So it's been actually pretty perfect. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you have a feel for how many cities um, have banned plastic bags over either in a nation or in the world? Is it quite common now or is it still quite uncommon that a city is doing this? It's not as common in the United States as one might think. And we thought that when um, all the local momentum that we had helped establish in Santa Barbara and throughout the state, the same thing was happening. There were over 200 local laws and that's what led to the state taking action. And we thought once our state took action that other states would then follow because that's a lot of times what happens with California. We lead the way on these things. And really, I think Maine just took action. Maine and Vermont just took action on styrofoam. The state of New York has taken action on plastic bags and the state of Hawaii has taken action on plastic bags. And I think maybe styrofoam too, but other than that, it's just sort of patchwork. Uh, along uh, around the rest of the country. So there's a surprising number of cities in Texas um, that have done away with some single-use plastics, mostly because they're coastal. You know, and coastal communities really bear the brunt of the impacts right. of single-use plastics. So, uh, and there's plenty of countries that have done, ban done bans as well, um, but again, not as many as certainly would be good, you know, as we would like to see. But I think there is still momentum. I think last year the real lesson was the straws um, because it's just been like this domino effect with straws. Yeah, tell people about um, what happened with that. <laughs> well, we went to city council um, just to sort of let them know that we were doing business outreach with a group of kids on, on straws. And then we took the kids with us to council and the kids really were pushing for getting rid of straws where we were just sort of thinking, maybe we'll start with on request and see how it goes from there because full on bans of everything can be, you know, onerous to businesses. And we wanted to start out kind of business friendly and maybe see if businesses would just turn over to a different type of straw on their own. Um, or go to on request on their own. It was a good opportunity to sort of partner with businesses. But in the end, when we went to city council, they said, well, won't we upset the kids if, if we don't do a ban? Oh, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> it, it was, it was. <laughs> so we ended up with a ban um, on straws and stirrers and then on request for cutlery. Because we're trying to do more comprehensive laws so that we don't have to exhaust ourselves and spend our entire life picking these things off one at a time. Because really the ultimate goal is to reduce the number holistically of single-use plastics and not just pick on one at a time. For sure. But the straws thing has really taken on life, uh, you know, cruise lines, airlines, amusement parks, um, they're, all, they're all really jumping on this bandwagon in very interesting ways, I think, just because it's a very easy um, green checkoff for them, you know. Absolutely. And people seem to make the connection very easily, oh, I don't need that. Whereas with plastic bags, it was like, wait, I need those for other things. Don't take them away. Um, but they're still going grocery shopping, so people are fine. Incredible work. You've been really moving and shaking since the moment you either came up with that idea at City College, and it just has grown into all of these things. Um, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, um, Earth Day and also if people are considering putting on an event of really any size, what are some things that they may want to consider in terms of really trying to make it a more sustainable event? Um, you know, little things, big things, because sometimes some communities don't have all of what they need to support the um, infrastructure. I know that even in Santa Barbara, we still have 
some work to do in that department. Um, but what, what can uh, organizers do and what can they share with maybe their vendors and things of that nature? Um, that's a great question. And, and we've worked at this incrementally, even with Earth Day over the years. So it's not just something where you can snap your fingers and have everything you want all at once. It took a while for us to put up a requirement about not having bottled water um, at the event, because when you have 30,000 people, and even if in smaller events, even a few thousand people, if you're not able to provide hydration for them, um, then that's a problem. You want people to be healthy while they're there. You don't want any problems with, with people, you know, getting dehydrated. Um, but at the same time, we really felt strongly that we wanted to avoid single use bottles. So it's, um, it's hard to get everybody to actually remember to bring it. Is, it is. And we, and we work that into no matter events, big and small, we work that into, we're doing an event in a couple of weeks and we put that in our Facebook event. You know, it doesn't even cost you any money to do a Facebook event. You put in there, Hey, remember to bring your reusable bottle. Then it makes people feel like they have something to contribute because we're saying, Hey, we're going to give you beverages, but bring your, bring your bottle. And so we do that with Earth Day and we have, really established some solid partnerships with some of our community water providers. Um, people, you know, they want people to subscribe to whatever they've got, whether it's yeah. RO system in their home or whatever. So they get something out of it and we get water stations out of it. And we even have some vendors now who aren't in the water business who say, hey, I'll bring, you know, a five gallon jug and have it at my booth and we can give wa water for dogs, have a dog dish and people can fill up their bottles. Um, so we've really tried to permeate the entire festival with that and not just in the food court so that people can get water whenever they need it, wherever they need it. And we have in the beer garden too. So people feel like they're drinking too much, they can switch over to water. So that's, that was a big thing. We've also started, you know, asking that people do fewer kind of tchotchke giveaways, you know, little plastic things right. that are little branded items, um, wrapped candy. So we've started closing in on, on, on setting parameters for that. Um, we've been doing waste management for a long time, and that is an expense, um, but because we are an event that's about sustainability, we really felt like having a mountain of waste at the end of the day wasn't, wasn't going to work for us on a lot of levels. Um, and so we have triple cans of landfill compost and recycling, and those get sorted by hand. Um, and actually, we brought that into the park a couple of years ago so that people could see the sorting so that it wasn't just like, oh, you're throwing this in can and now you don't have to think about it anymore. So here, so come look at it. That. Yeah, and then we took it even farther and we're offering beer tickets for people who will, um, or kombucha tickets for people who will sort for 30 minutes. Oh, wow, I like that idea. Yeah, people had a good time with it and it helps our, our um, partner that is doing all the sorting. Um, and so because we do that, then we've been able to require that our food vendors use all compostable foodware materials so that that doesn't, none of that ends up in the trash. It all ends up going back to the soil. We also work, and this is easy to do, you know, just a, just a, a publicity campaign to ask people to come car free. Um, we work with our local bike coalition to have valley parking for bikes so people can feel confident that they bring their bike there and it's going to be safe or and we also work with the transit district to encourage people to come car free in other ways if they don't have a bike or aren't able to bike they can take the bus um, to the event so there's lots of ways that you can encourage people to be sustainable on the consumer side and, and, and ask your vendors to be sustainable without placing a lot of burden on them mm -hmm. great ideas and so many things that do need to take kind of an incremental aspect it is hard to change it all at once with the little things that you can do and you know as you know i was trying to do a lot of that stuff with summer solstice this year and it is you know you know we have over the course of three days somewhere around 80 or so thousand people coming in and trying to hydrate them and all of that and it is challenging so it's it's a work in progress but there's something else i wanted to chat with you about Recently, I think um, you mentioned there was a new law passed where people can bring uh, reusable materials to just like grocery store or anywhere where they would refill something. Can you talk a little bit about that and what people can share? And is that regional, statewide, national? What, what is the scoop on that? Great question. Um, it is called AB 619 and it is a California law. So, so far, 
uh, California is the only state that I know of that has it. And really, it feels to me like it was designed to relax some of the health department regulations that prohibit or are a barrier for people bringing their own containers to a restaurant or a place that has to go food. Um, because there's a lot of people who want, don't want to take a plastic you know, clamshell container, but that's the only choice that they're given. So this law, I, I believe it doesn't go into effect till January 1st, 2020. Um, it's a really simple law. If you look it up, it's a one pager, which just makes it really nice to, awesome. to read. Um, and it, it makes it easier for someone to bring their own container to a restaurant and it allows the restaurant to accept that behind the counter, fill it and give it back to them. Where before with health department regulations, there was sort of this thing called cross contamination. If you're bringing something in, we can't be sure that it's not going to bring germs into our kitchen. But it's requiring that they place it on a surface that they sanitize right after they fill it. So they can put it on a tray behind the counter, fill it up with whatever you ordered, give it to you, and then just sanitize the tray. Whether that means putting it in their dishwasher or just spraying it down, I don't know. I think that's going to be up to the individual business. Um, but it, it just makes it easier on the business so that they don't have to say, oh, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some provisions in there for events that make it so that you can provide reusable flatware mm. at events, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm not sure how we'll wash it <laughs> because it does have to be washed and how much we'll need, but maybe we can pilot that. You know, next year is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, so we are going to be going big and trying a lot of different new things and having, you know, special activities. So I think that that will be one of the promotions that we at least, you know, like I said, baby steps, do something incremental so that some of the food vendors maybe have real forks. Uh -huh. um, Cause even compostable forks that are sent back to dirt, there's still, there's still an impact with that. So if we can use real forks and it might feel more special. You know. Oh, especially to celebrate the 50th anniversary and then to test it out, see how it goes, and then, you know, tweak it from there. That's huge. That will be so cool. I can't wait for that. Yeah, I'm excited. And we will obviously always share what we do with you so that if anything will work for Solstice. Oh, for I know sure. there's portable dishwashers in there. Celebrate. I love it. <laughs> um, you also, besides festivals, you have a number of different initiatives going on, but you also have uh, panels and discussions and talks about environmental issues. Can you talk about maybe some of the things you have coming up, what the benefit that has been to your organization over time, and any kind of key uh, takeaways or suggestions you have for people organizing similar things? Um, partnerships are always good. Like we've done, there, there haven't been a lot of environmental movies in the last year or so, but I think it was in 2016, 2017, maybe there were several. And we um, partnered with a local junior high that has a fabulous auditorium with a great screen um, and did a screening there. We did one at the Libero Theater, which is another beautiful theater in town. Um, so when there's movies, it's, it's fun to show those, especially if they don't get a run in a regular movie theater. And partnerships are always great with that because they then you have several groups sharing out to their full list to get people in the door. Um, keeping ticket prices low is always a goal for me. We're doing a lecture in a couple of weeks um, that a, a UCSB professor lecture through the local Harvard Club here. And originally the price was twenty five dollars, and you just and they said, well, all my, all that money's going to go to you. You're the nonprofit beneficiary. And I said, well, I'd rather have. 150 people paying $10 than, you know, 30 people paying $25, not just for us, you know, our bottom line, but also because you want to get more people in the door right. and I'm also working to get them to comp high school students if they want to go. So I think with the smaller events, breaking even to me is, is the preferable goal because then you can be more open to having a bigger audience. Um, because because that's you know you want more people to be affected and to be impacted and to say walk away saying okay I'm going to change this and this in my daily life that's that's the ultimate goal rather than just you know getting an extra couple hundred dollars from a from a small event for sure that's Absolutely. why we do the big ones so we can make enough money to to help us um, put on other ones throughout the year awesome and you have with your team um, you have some full or, or, we're kind of talking and sharing with people how to build an effective team as well. And um, I know you have 
really an incredible team of not only volunteers, some contractors, full, some full-time staff. Um, can you maybe add just a, a tip or two on how you build how you build your a strong team? It really helps to have somebody who's very savvy on social media. So we have a communications manager who's a contract employee who really helps with us with navigating that world. It really helps to have one voice, you know, so that it's consistent and sounds good. Um, so we feed her materials that we want to have posted and have her do all the postings. Um, that That's that Nicole, helps a lot. Right? She's mm -hmm. fabulous. Miss Nicole. Yes. Miss um, Nicole, yes, she's awesome. So so that definitely helps. Um, and you know, did the team, the rest of the team depends on what we're doing. You know, we've got our energy team focused next month on National Drive Electric Month, so they have the expertise there. So it just depends on what we're doing that fits into our team's expertise. Awesome. And since I think we're just about up with time, is there anything else that you'd like to share um, with our audience that maybe we didn't cover? Um, just that. Um, I think now is a great time to have a sustainability focus, whether it's big or small. You know, it's become part of the zeitgeist now. People are aware of it and interested in it, even if they didn't know anything about it a few years ago. You know, it's, it's really, I think, become more common that we want to do our part for the world and for the next generations. So, like, I went to Bottle Rock Music Festival in May in Napa, and that's not about green at all but they had a lot of green initiatives including composting there so i think that green street cred matters even if that's not the focus of what you're doing um and it's certainly like like i said just asking people to bring their own bottle when you do something helps them feel more engaged mm -hmm. and that they are participating on a deeper level beautiful well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all you're doing for our community. You are a true leader. And I'm just so thankful um, to know you and to continue to learn from all of what you're doing. So thank you for, for all of what you do. Thank you, Robin. I feel the same about you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll see you in the group and we'll catch you soon.